Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, as we mentioned, I am the director of the Marine Science Program at the University of South Carolina, right here in Columbia. That's right. Marine Science. Yeah. Right. And when I say marine science, it's the first thing all of you think about. Oysters. Whales and dolphins. But it turns out I didn't study whales and dolphins. I'm actually, I studied the chemistry of the ocean and how that impacts organisms. And a lot of the work that I do relates directly to climate change. Now, if you are like the rest of the United States, most of you have immediately tuned me out with those two very simple words. Whales and dolphins, climate change. <laughs> And I'm serious. I mean, many of you are now out here seeing me. <laughs> now, this is not just my personal problem. It turns out that this is true. This really is true across the United States. There's data to back me up. You actually think about the United States as a whole and their viewpoints about <laughs> and how climate is changing. It turns out, at most, 40% of the people. There we go. 40% of the people believe that maybe climate change is happening, they're a little concerned about it, think maybe humans are having a role. But by far, the remaining 60% across the United States, perhaps a little bit more here in South Carolina, <laughs> really just don't want to have anything to do with it. All right? They're cautious, maybe climate's changing, maybe we play a role, but you know. I don't really want to have that conversation. And I realize now that, you know, the reason why, at least to some extent, that's such a, a low number, is that, frankly, it's depressing. <laughs> Who wants to talk about climate change? Right? Not only is the glass half empty, but there's arsenic in it. That's right, arsenic. So, for people who know me, they know that I'm actually a very positive person. They might actually be a little surprised that I, that I study climate. And so, in my mind, we really need to change the conversation just a little bit. Just a little bit. And perhaps think about not having this depressing concept. The world is ending, right? But really think about it in another way, right? Maybe glass half full, right? Some days. <laughs> All right, so this is this is my challenge. Let's, let's talk about climate in a very different way. Now, before we begin, let me just be clear. Our climate is changing, and humans are playing a role in that change. <laughs> dramatically, dramatically in the last thousand years, about 100 parts per million. It's about 25 to 30 percent higher than we've seen on this planet in the last million years. Not only is it increasing, but it's doing so incredibly rapidly. And if you just, just straight up, right, we've not seen that change again in a very long time. All right, so what does that mean? Well, as a chemist, Right? Who thinks about climate? One of the biggest things is it's, it's, it's getting hotter. All right? Now, this, I love this graph because this takes the last 150 years and it ranks them just by temperature. And it color codes them based on the decade when that temperature was recorded. So if you look behind me, you'll see the, the blues and the greens and the, you know, the purples here. Those from 1850 to 1909, that's right up there at the very top, and then it kind of changes in this beautiful rainbow of colors. I try and bring art. Then <laughs> you see those from yellows to oranges. And the thing that I really want you to pay attention to is that it is related in time. As you get to the reds, that's in the last 10 years, it's been the hottest. And that's a trend that's continuing to occur. Yeah, there's little dips and valleys, but that's a fairly <coughs> substantial trend. And in fact, for those of you who read the New York Times, notice that yes, this last year, 2012, the United States, hottest on record. Right? 
And for those of you actually who are here a few weeks ago, shorts and t-shirts, someone who hates the cold, life is good. Life is good for me. Okay. But no, let's seriously, let's, let's think about this. What are the impacts then of increasing temperatures? What are, what are the impacts? All right. Well, one of the things that we know happens when you increase the temperature is you melt ice. You melt ice. And in the Arctic, this is one of the places where we can really see this happening the most. The top panel is from September of 1984. These are satellite images. The bottom panel is from just this past September of 2012. And visually, you can see that there's a huge difference in the amount of ice that is actually occurring during the summer in the Arctic. And if you were to think about that ice loss, that is the states of Alaska, California, and Texas combined with the amount of ice that's been, that's disappeared. And if you put it in an even broader perspective, that means about 30 to 50 years, all the ice that we have in the Arctic during the summer is going to be gone. So what does that mean? Right? Well, if you're a polar bear, <laughs> the glass has definitely happened. <laughs> okay? It's definitely half empty. If you're a caffeine drinker like I am, I'm a scientist. Apparently I drink the most caffeine of any profession. Um, it's also bad for Coke. Right? So, um, they're trying hard to pull my I ask that you know if you really are into conservation, particularly about polar bears, go visit that website. But that's depressing, right? That's depressing. Let's, let's make some good thoughts here about this. All right? Ah. Well, it turns out that if you melt all of the ice in the Arctic, it's not such a scary place anymore, is it? Okay. And in fact, if you look at this red line, and here's the blue line. The blue line is what takers now have to go Right? They have to go all the way around. So if you're coming from Asia, you have to go all the way around the state through the Panama Canal and go right through in order to get over into Europe. That is a long way. That is a long way. But if you melt all the ice in the Arctic, <laughs> that is definitely glass half full. <laughs> right? I mean, we're talking a straight shot right through the Northwest Passage. And believe it or not, I know that this is a little bit difficult to see, but in, just in 2009, two German ships actually did this. This, was, this has already happened. Save 10 days in time, 3,400 miles. Think about the amount of money, time of people, effort. Think about how cheap things are going to be if it's actually, you know, you don't have to go so far in order to transport it. So, okay, I think that's a glass half full. It's a glass half full. Let's talk about something else. The Arctic has a huge potential for oil and gas. In fact, a lot of people, when they think about the Arctic, that's one of the things that they think about. But also, the Arctic is an incredible mineral reserve. That's right. Forget the oil and gas. Minerals. In this increasing technological society that we have, we rely on nickel, cadmium, titanium, for you cyclists in the audience. All right. And the Arctic, once you melt all of that ice, you can get that, that, those materials out much more easily. And again, you think this is not something that other people are thinking about? Do you recognize that flag? That's Russia's. And back in 2007, Russia actually went in, they actually went under the ice at that time, and they planted their flag. This is Russia. All right. Because they recognize that, yes, glass is definitely half full when it comes to mineral resources. So let's talk about a, a third thing, OK? And now this is kind of a glass half empty, half full. We're not really sure what's going on here. Um, it turns out that when you have lots of sunlight, um, and the sunlight penetrates in the ocean, you get plants to bloom, right? The base of the food web. But as that ice starts to melt, Right? The sun then can penetrate more deeply into the water, right? You get more light, right? You've got the tree of ice, 
more light means more phytoplankton, more organisms growing in the deep ocean. That's fabulous because, hey, they're the base of food, right? And that allows the larger fish and the whales that are out there that eat that food to proliferate and be happy. All right, glass half full. But the problem with this is, is that by changing the timing of when those blooms occur, when that base of the food web really gets bigger and all those organisms are out there, well, timing is important. And what if you change the dynamics such that when those whales are actually moving up into the Arctic and ready to eat, all the food is already gone. It's like putting out the buffet line that everyone's out on vacation when that buffet line is there. Right? They're in line still. They haven't made their way up. And again, this is a question of, oh, but we simply don't know the answer, right? Glass half full, glass half empty. So this is, this is a big discussion that certain people that I'm starting to have with my colleagues. Okay, so talk about the Arctic. All right, let's, let's, let's switch sides. Okay, let's go down to the southern hemisphere. Let's talk about the Antarctic. And I want to talk about the Antarctic because when you melt ice that's on continents or it's above the water, that ice melts and adds to the volume of seawater. That's really sea level rise. And this photo here is a color satellite image from the Larson shelf. And I'd like to show this one, even though it's back from 2002, because this is one of the most dramatic periods of ice breakup and loss that we actually have recorded. All right, and there's certainly been a lot bigger ones that have happened since then, but, but this is just a beautiful representation. You can actually see right here as it's starting, there's the ice, and then boom, it just all just gets shoved down and melts and makes its way into the ocean. It's literally the size of Rhode Island right now. We just lost Rhode Island, about 1,200 square kilometers, and it happens in a period of just two weeks. Just two weeks. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, for us here in Columbia, well, let's see, right? If you look at our coastline back about 20,000 years ago, sea level was actually 120 meters lower than it is today. 120 meters lower. All that water was locked up into the ice sheets. So then, that means that if you take that ice and you melt it, sea level is going to rise. And in fact, if you were to melt all the ice sheets in Greenland and in the Antarctic, sea level would be 70 meters higher than it is today. 70 meters higher. All right? Okay. Anyone from Charleston? Myrtle <laughs> Beach? Glass is definitely half empty for you. <laughs> All right? But here in Columbia? Oh, yeah. Waterfront properties. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And so when we talk about climate change, I think it's really important that we don't talk about it in terms of the world is ending, glasses have empty, arsenic in it. We really need to change the discussion. We need to reframe the question. Because there is at least 60%, if not more, of people who simply aren't going to be at the table if you talk about it in such terms. Rather, my challenge to you is to talk about climate a little bit differently. And to think about it a little bit differently. And understand that, yes, right, there are going to be winners.